Jesus, yes, I love you. I love you. Jesus, thank you. Father of lies, oh, you delight in your children, because every good and perfect gift comes from you, because every good and perfect gift comes from you, because every good your church with tongues of fire. Holy Spirit move. Leave no trace of man's desire. Spirit burn right through. Spirit burn. Spirit
your church with tongues of fire. Holy Spirit move. Leave no trace of man's desire. Spirit burn right through. Spirit burn. Spirit burn. Well, good morning, Vineyard Church Peoria. My name is Tammy. And it is my pleasure to lead worship this morning with you. I invite you to stand and sing with us as we uh, start our service in song. with us. 
each and every morning will tell of his great love, of his faithful mercies, and all that he has done. For who can match his kindness, and who can count his works? Oh, let our praise continue. right to give him thanks and praise for his heart is overflowing with love for us and his mercy we can never contain it is good to lift the name of the lord our god it is right to give him thanks and praise for his heart is overflowing with love for us and his mercy we can never contain it is right to give him thanks Amen. Amen. Take a moment and say good morning to someone. Maybe you haven't had a chance to greet yet, and uh, someone will be up with announcements. everyone. Good to see you. Good morning to those joining us online. We're glad that you're here with us at Vineyard Peoria. Uh, if you're checking us out for the first time, we want to say a special welcome to you. Um, we're glad that you made this part of your weekend. And just to let you know, our gathering today, we'll spend some time uh, in just a minute singing some more songs to Jesus, worshiping Him. We'll hear a teaching from the Bible. And then we'll end our service by taking time to pray for each other. And uh, we're not real uh, concerned about the clock, but generally it lasts somewhere from 75 to 90 minutes. Uh, and then prayer and ministry will often continue um, beyond the end of the service. So if there's any way we can help you today, uh, drop a comment in the chat or find someone with a name tag here in the room. We'd be glad to answer your questions. One of the best ways that you can stay connected to everything that's going on around the Vineyard Church is the Church Center app. So if you don't have that app, I would highly encourage you to download it. It's available for Google and Apple devices. And once you do, you can just punch in Vineyard Church Peoria and stay up to date. There's also, I was just showing somebody this morning, there's a direct link to our YouTube channel um, and archive of sermons and all kinds of good information there. Um, most of you are probably already aware, but just to remind you, um, if you were planning to stay for our Vineyard Connect lunch, that is today, right after the service, and so we would love to have you join us for that. Um, it'll probably be about 15 minutes after the service uh, gets over, because we have to give just enough time to let kids check out happen and, and make sure everything's the tables and things are already set up. So it'll be a pretty quick turnaround. Um, but we'd love for you to stay and join us for that. Um, it's actually in the kids' space. If you go out to the cafe and go back through the orange hallway, that's where we'll be gathering for that in just a little while. Make sure I'm not forgetting anything here. Uh, I am about to forget something very important. We would love for you to fill out a Connect card. Um, especially if it's your first or second time, if you have prayer requests, if you have an answer to prayer or a God story that you want to share, uh, that's an easy way for you to communicate with us and uh, let us know what's going on with you so that we can better connect. 
Um, if you are watching or joining us for the first time, the first time you fill out a Connect card, um, that will trigger an email that will get sent to you. And we would love to make a $5 donation on your behalf as a way of celebrating uh, you taking that first step and sharing in our value of generosity. So with that, I'm going to invite you, if you would, why don't you go ahead and stand back up. We're going to turn it over to the team and spend some time worshiping through music and song. And uh, I'm just excited about what the Lord has for us today. Why don't we pray? Father, in Jesus' name, we just welcome you into this place. And right now, we just turn our affections towards you. We welcome you to be present. We welcome you to encounter us as we worship today, in Jesus' name. In our faithless worries, in our hopes and dreams, you have always been there. The God who's gone before us, the God who never leaves. So how do we forget that you are all our rest? Jesus, we relent. Thank you for your presence. Breathe in. Sing out. Oh, my soul.
You set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. To set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I want more of you,
Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for being here. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for the way that you are moving on your people. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, worshipers. Well, how are you? You sound, sounded like you were doing pretty good to me. <laughs> That's just my take. But uh, I love it. Hmm. Why don't we pray? Jesus, we are so, so grateful for you, for your presence, for who you are to us, for the ways that you encounter us, the ways that you meet us. And we just ask now, Father, even in this moment of transition, that you would continue to be present, that you would continue to move, that you would be the central focus of our time here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know what better setup there could be, but today's message is about kingdom worship. And uh, we're going to explore some things. We're going to talk about some theological concepts. And I thought I would start by just talking to you a little bit about this idea. Um, now, you might get this idea sometimes because I refer to us as those who live in the Western hemispheres, having a certain worldview that I'm like down on us, and I think everybody else has got it. That, that, that's not the case, but it's important for us to understand that sometimes the way that we view the world is not the way that the rest of the world views the world. Sometimes we, th and that's, that's okay, I, I'm not saying that's wrong. But one of our tendencies is to be very em empirical, very data-based, logical, analytical. And again, those things in and of themselves are not bad, are not wrong. They're actually needed and helpful. But there's also the reality that sometimes we get things backwards when it comes to concepts in the kingdom. And we think our primary method of, of moving forward is to study something, is to get more knowledge about it. To, and again, I like none of these things are bad. We need to be students. We need to learn. But we have this, this phrase that's been around for a long time. Some things are better caught than taught. Now, I've told you before, if we're going to have theology, we should have good theology. Same goes for teaching. If we're going to have teaching, we should have good teaching, not bad teaching. But there are some things that I can't just convey to you by simply teaching you the concepts and, and reading you the scriptures and, and sort of giving you three points in a poem, if you will. Some things that we're trying to pursue are actually caught simply by being in the atmosphere of where that thing is happening. And worship is one of the most obvious illustrations of that. Now, there are certain things that we're going to dive into and, and look at and, and try to teach and get us to maybe think differently about. But really, for me to stand before you today and try to teach you about worship, the best way to learn worship is to do worship and to be in a community that is pursuing that, that is learning to worship, both by teaching but also by experience. 
by allowing the Spirit to lead us. And, and those of you that have been around for a while know this has always been a value of ours, both the vineyard movement of churches, but even for us particularly, that, that over the last 12 years of the existence of this particular local body, that's a common theme that, that people would convey as that there, there's something about the way that the community connects to God in worship that is not better necessarily than any other church, but, but there's something unique about it. We have a way of stewarding the presence of God that is unique to us. That, that, and, and we like to say, just to kind of put a pin on the map of where we're going, worship is a place that we go. Now, you could mean a lot of different things by that. Well, for now, I'm simply saying worship is one of the processes, and I'm going to define it for you here in a moment, but when we talk about worship being a place that we go, it's into that intimate relationship with the one who we're singing to, with our good Father, with Jesus, and being able to share with him in vulnerability or in brokenness or in celebration or in wherever you're at, going into that place of, of intimacy and sharing with him and communing with him. Well, before I go too far, let me jump to this quote from John Wimber. If, now, if you've been around the vineyard, that name might be familiar to you, but if not, John was the founder of the Vineyard Church in Anaheim, California, which was sort of the flagship. He, I, I always feel compelled to say he technically was not the founder of uh, Vineyard from day one. There were already several Vineyard churches in Southern California, and John had a background in the Quaker church and had then uh, partnered up with Chuck Smith and been part of the Calvary Chapel movement. And then eventually, there was a man by the name of Ken Gullickson, who, who is still alive today, who actually is the founder of the original, I think there were seven or eight vineyard churches that existed when the idea came along that John's church, which is a Calvary chapel at the time, probably fit better. Why don't you go join up with the vineyard churches? And in a short period of time after that, Ken, recognizing John's gifts, said, well, why don't you sort of lead us as an association, as a group of churches of seven or eight at that time. And under John, this is why John is often referred to as the founder, because under John's leadership, uh, the vineyard went from a handful of churches in Southern California over the last 40 years to now several thousand around the globe. Now, if you study like church history and stuff like 40 years is a pretty short period of time, so that's a pretty phenomenal growth. Now, the th interesting thing about it, now I'm not going to stay on vineyard history too long, but if you can tell, I enjoy this stuff. 40 years is, is a pretty short period of time. You must think, man, John must have just been a really, you know, ambitious entrepreneur. You know, he had it all figured out. And he, it was never John's desire. I actually know multiple stories. John, John loved the whole church. And he often thought that one of the gifts that Vineyard was to steward was to help bring renewal to the broader church. And so they would go and do conferences and, and different things in, in all different flavors of churches, not with the intention of, oh, you should become Vineyard, but, you know, God has given us something to give to you as a gift and to help bring renewal and revitalization. And that was a significant part of his ministry. Well, I know in several cases there were churches in different parts of the world where John would visit, and, and they would ask, you know, well, we, we should become vineyard. No, like, you need to stay with, you know, your Anglican or your Methodist. And, and eventually, over time, it just, it kind of became beyond John's ability to, to, to keep a lid on it, because a lot of folks who begin to align with certain values and things that, that we were about uh, just thought, well, I want, I want to be in the tribe. And so, the vineyard became sort of a church planting movement. It, it, it by the power of the Holy Spirit, multiplied, um, of which we are a result. This church, and, and if you're coming to our class, you'll hear a little bit more about our story, um, was a church planted out of another vineyard church 12 years ago from the Urbana Church, which our founding pastor Ben also helped start, uh, you know, 40 plus years ago. 
So anyway, back to worship. Uh, this is just foundational for us as vineyard people. This quote from John, worship, the act of freely giving love to God forms and informs every activity of the Christian life. Worship, the act of freely giving love to God, and, and I would even add there, you know, what we would call deep or, or intimate worship is doing that in the context of, of being completely vulnerable, of completely open. And, and we'll talk a little bit later about this idea that as we do that, as we open ourselves up and begin to express that in the context of an intimate relationship, uh, God, God is involved in that. It's not, a, it's not a one-way street. Now, it's all about Him. Our purpose in coming to worship is not uh, for us. Um, I'm pausing because that's at the end. I don't want to jump ahead. Uh, but in that context, God actually, th- this is what some people would call God, God's glory. That when, when things begin to shift and you, in a moment of, of bringing adoration or praise or thanksgiving or whatever your particular emotion is, as you bring that to the Lord in, in singing of songs or whatever the, the sort of avenue is, the Lord begins to interact with you, begins to encounter it, and that's what we, that presence of God or could also be called the glory of God, is, is what you begin to sense. Your, your senses are sort of heightened, and you become aware in a way that we, it's easy for us to say, yes, God, God is present because he, he lives in us, and there's evidence of him working in the world. Well, that's true, but there's also times and moments where you begin to be able to say, God is present, and, and I, I feel him. I sense him. Like, it could even be that I smell him. That's not, like, common, but I, I've heard of different and experienced different times where the fragrance in the room will actually change as a result of God's manifest presence. And so that sort of process and, and, and the presence of God becoming real to us, it changes everything. It, it forms and informs every other activity that we might do. Now, you know, I talk all the time about, for us as believers, this is not, our, our Christian walk is not a list of activities to do to make sure we're in good with the, the big man upstairs, right? Like, that, that's pretty basic level for us. We, we have an understanding of that. Well, that's this concept is part of the reason for that, and, and it's where you, there might sometimes be confusion. You say, well, you know, it, it's not about, you know, checking a list and I read my Bible today and I said a prayer over, my, you know. We understand that it's not, it's not like that, but we say those things are still important. Worship is what brings life to, to disciplines and things that could otherwise be dry. So in other words, if you pick up your Bible on Monday morning and, and you know, do one of the, the super spiritual things, oh, here's where I'm going to, no, I'm just kidding. It's okay if you do that. Um, you pick up your Bible on Monday morning to read, and you start reading, and it's just like, gosh, this is, this is th- wherever you land, this is kind of dry. This is kind of hard. And I've told you before, you know, we'll make, sometimes just, just keep reading until he starts talking. Because all of the different, and, and, and we'll probably do a series at some time in the future about spiritual disciplines. But any form of spiritual discipline is an invitation to better know the one that we're seeking. So in other words, as I've told you before, when it comes to reading the Bible, it's not so that I can puff myself up and say, I now have six chapters of this memorized, and I can tell you all. I probably told you before, I was in, a, I did Bible sword drill when I was a kid, you know, and there was all the things, and you had it, and they would call out a verse, and, you know, who can flip to it the fastest, you know. It's a benefit that I memorize Scripture. Like, I, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, but it's not an end in and of itself. It's an invitation to know him, to begin to understand what he's like and to be drawn into that intimate relationship with him. 
And so I have found, now you have to find what works for you. If I'm having trouble reading, and I have a, sometimes an overactive mind, I know, there's nobody else in the room who struggles with that. Sometimes for me, it's something as simple as I need to put on some, now it has to be instrumental, I don't want people singing because then I get distracted. I'll just put on some light music in the background to help me focus. But, but uh, sometimes what I need to do is say, you know what, I sat down to read this, I need to get myself centered in worship. And so sometimes I'll stop and I'll, and I'll focus on that and I'll either pray or I'll put a list on YouTube or whatever, but try to begin to aim myself towards having thankfulness, towards having gratitude, appreciation, adoration. And, I, and as I become able to worship, the word can become alive. I, now, I'm not saying that the hard part suddenly sometimes become not hard. Sometimes we just got to dig in and, why is this hard? What's going on here? And, and we can talk more about how to, how to do that with the Bible some other time. All right, let's jump to the Scripture. So I have a few different things that I want to draw out and get to where we're going. Uh, Psalms 103, first two verses, if you have a Bible or a Bible device, this will also be on the screen. Um, I pulled out for this particular one the contemporary English version. And I'd encourage you to read more. It's a, it's a great chapter. I mean, all of Psalms is great. But uh, verses 1 and 2, With all of my heart I praise the Lord. With all that I am, I praise his holy name. With all my heart, I praise the Lord. I will never forget how kind he has been. There's a word that's repeated in there that I want us to focus on. It's that word heart. We talked a little bit before about how, again, in our culture, the heart is the seat of emotion. So that's why we talk about, you know, being moved in your heart, Jesus coming to live in your heart. Oh, if you get hurt, oh, that, you know, that hurt my heart. That's the seed of emotion for us. Well, there's this reality when we start talking about worship in the kingdom, the heart is always where worship begins. And sometimes just as, as we read this scripture, you know, with all my heart, I praise the Lord. It's a choice. It's a choice to give words to expressing that adoration and that praise to the Lord. And now I think, well, that, that's kind of cerebral. Like that, I, I can just, yes, you can just decide to do that. But actual worship is not an intellectual activity. It's a heart activity. It's interacting with one who, I thought that was something else. It's Okay. Um, it's a heart activity. And so as we begin to interact with God, we know that God is spirit. And in truth, we are, we are spiritual people. And so we interact with him on that level. The heart is always where worship begins. Now, this is what I started to say earlier. We have this tendency, uh, especially when it comes to learning something. <laughs> the sliders is... You can't lean on the table very hard because it'll just keep going. <laughs> when it comes to learning something, well, first of all, I might think, well, worship's not something we can learn. Well, it's true that I can't just, like I said, give you three points in a poem and say, now you know worship. It is something you have to experience. But, but what I want to begin to help you understand is we often think when it comes to learning anything or becoming a student of something, that we need to get as much knowledge as we can, and then, then our heart will, will catch up. Once I understand it, then I can fully engage with it. And I think it's one of those things that in the kingdom, it's actually the total opposite of that. We, we actually need to start with the heart. We actually need to just be around it, encounter God, let him impact us in our heart, in our emotions, I know some of you is like, well, that sounds kind of scary and embarrassing. You know, I don't, I don't want to have my emotions impacted in a, in a public setting. Well, I'll, I'll step to the side and say, the stuff we're talking about is not just for worship here in the gathering. You can actually do this 24-7.
actually a healthy and vibrant life of worship is expressed not just on Sunday morning, but before you go to bed at night, when you wake up in the morning, when you have a coffee, it can be anywhere. Because if we really believe, as we've been telling you and, and trying to live towards that, God is less than an arm's length away, then he's always there. We can always begin to engage this process. But what I would encourage you is if this is a, sort of a difficult thing to begin to, to try to get a hold of, is just let it impact your heart. Just begin listening. This is why, you know, even though we encourage you to, to stand and, and participate, because when we worship together as a group, we want it to be accessible to everybody, we're also okay, and we say sometimes, you know, if you want to just sit and listen, like if that's where you're at, and you're like, I don't get this worship thing, just sit and listen. Take it in. Let it, let it impact you. Let the words, let this, like, just, just soak in it. That's okay. We don't, we don't have an expectation of what you need to do for us because it's not about us. But we want to make it accessible to you because the truth is, as we begin to experience worship in our heart, we begin to encounter God. And anytime we encounter the presence of God, we begin to become more like God. And so this process of worship in the kingdom is that we are becoming like Jesus. Because this is true in all different kinds of realms, that we become like what or who in this case. We become like what we worship. So uh, I had this conversation with Dan a couple of weeks ago uh, and introduced him to a term which many of you may not know. How many of you know what a foamer is? No? I'm not seeing a lot of hands. A foamer, my wife would be laughing if she was in here because this has been going on for a while. A foamer, now actually you can apply it to a lot of different things, but in my particular niche, I uh, love and have a history with model railroading. Now that might be news to some of you because it's not something I've done actively in the last couple of years. But HO scale, you know, scene building and model, like that's always been fascinating to me. It's something I've, I've been around and been involved with as a hobby. What, within the context of the, the railroad hobbyist community, a foamer is someone that when you see trains, you, you kind of like begin to foam at the mouth a little bit. <laughs> so you're a foamer. This is like, because that's the thing that you're excited about. And you, want, and you want to learn more about it. You want, to, you want to see what's the cool new thing they came out with or, you know, what, what new line is Walter's putting out in the catalog this week? Or, you know, like, it's just, it's just a, you know, hopefully I don't actually foam at the mouth, but you, you get the picture. Like, it, it's the, there's a level of excitement that, that when you encounter that thing or when you interact with that thing, you, you, you get excited. I, I, want, I want to get into it. I want to learn about it. That's what we're talking about. It's like when it comes to God, it's, it's not just intellectual. It's that there's a, a hunger. That I, I, I want to know more of God. I want to experience more of God. I want to see what is he up to today? What is he, up, what is he wanting to do in my life this week? Uh, here's an interesting uh, way to look at it. Uh, you've got a really serious problem. Now, I'm not real good at this, but hopefully we can move towards it. How many of you, when you have a real serious problem that you're trying to figure out, wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, I'm just excited to see how you're going to fix this. How you're, what, what, what kind of creative solutions that I haven't even thought of you have lined up and available to fix this problem that's going on in my life. Now, let's be honest. Most of us, that's not our default. That's not where we start. But that is like a, a heart posture of worship, is that we understand what he's like and what he's about to the point that even when we have some unsolvable problem, we can actually come to him, Jesus, you know what? 
I actually think you're good enough to handle this. I think you're big enough. I think you have enough tools in your tool belt, even if I don't. That I'm, I'm Now, it's hard to say, well, we get excited when there's a problem. I'm not saying you don't feel the weight of the problem. But there begins to be just a little level of excitement that, you know, what's that, that uh, the song we sing? Um, he won't. Like, why, why like, you know, and, and then I think of the, you know, he did it before and he can do it again. It's a whole other. I always have way too many illustrations running around in my head. But it's like, we've seen him do these things before. And yet we have trouble believing he's going to do it this time. Rather than believing, you know what, Jesus, I don't know how you're going to solve this. I don't know what solution you've got lined up. I don't know if it's going to be easy, it's going to be hard, it's going to be sudden, if it's going to be a process. But you know, I, I actually think you're, you're good. I think you're good, good enough to handle it. I think you're big enough to handle it. I'm excited to see how you're going to move in this situation how you're going to, now, <laughs> this is that scary prayer, sometimes, how are you going to change me? Sometimes we just need reoriented to the problem, right? Like, it's not always just get that thing out of my way. Sometimes we need reoriented. We need adjusted. And that's part of that vulnerability. When we come to Him in worship, we are focused on him. We are, are declaring his worth. We are responding to his glory. And we're also opening ourselves up and saying, you know, Lord, I, I, I feel broken in this area. And I, I'm, I'm trying to be excited for how I think you're going to move, but I, I don't know what to do here. You know, that's a completely valid thing to express in the context of worship. I mean, we, we want to declare the goodness of the Lord. We want to declare His good deeds and His nature and His character. But you can also come to the Lord in worship and say, Here I am, Lord. I feel broken. And I still believe I can encounter you. I still believe you're good. And you know, He's not always going to come in that moment and fix everything but if you trust him, if you open yourself up to him, he's not going to disappoint. He's not going to fail this time, just as he didn't fail last time. But one of the things, I, I, I kind of mentioned this already, worship, amongst other things, and we could go through in detail uh, you know, the, how we worship God as, as king and creator, and, and we could sort of make a, a long list but I just felt to focus this morning, worship, among other things, is response to God's glory. So as we come to Him and begin that process and encounter Him, and He comes and meets with us, we, we, we begin to respond as we recognize it, it's real. It, it's not just theory. It's not just, yes. I know in my head God is good because that's what the book says. No, it's encountering him in a way that as you sing or, or talk or, or whatever the, the channel or medium is, that there becomes to be a realization, oh, oh, in my heart I actually feel that you're real. I actually feel you speaking to me. I, I, I feel like you're, you're saying this to me or... Or, you know, suddenly you have a thought. And like, oh, you know, I never thought about approaching my problem that way. I wonder if that would make a difference. Now, this is not all about solving problems. My point is that when we open ourselves up to God, He opens Himself up to us. Catherine Kuhlman described prayer this way as an act of mutual self-giving. That as we give ourselves fully to God, he in turn gives himself back to us. That's part of the process that happens in worship. The other thing that I want to focus on before I wrap up here is that worship stirs 
worship. Now, we need to unpack that a little bit. But this is what I'm talking about. If you if you're, feel like you're at the very beginning of the journey with this idea of worship, like, yeah, Matthew, you know, it, it, it sounds like you're describing good things, but I, I, don't, I don't know where to get started. I, I don't know. This is just still kind of foreign to me. That's okay. We're, we're all at different places, and we've all, we've all had to be at the starting line at some point. Worship stirs worship. When we said early in the message about how worship, you know, like informs every other activity in our Christian life, this is part of what we're talking about, is that just being in the atmosphere, just like being around worship, it's one of the reasons there's a value for us gathering is, you know, uh, let me put it this way. For me personally, and for you, depending on where you're at on the journey, I could not have a what I would describe as a vibrant, ongoing, intimate lifestyle of worship and communion with God if the only time I talked to Him and met with Him was in this hour and a half on Sunday morning. And that makes sense. In the same way that you don't easily subsist if the only time you eat is when we put donuts out on the coffee bar on Sunday morning. You're probably not going to be feeling real good by the next... Now, I mean, you could probably survive that long, but... You're not going to be healthy. You're not going to be satisfied. So if you feel like you're at the beginning of the journey, just get around worship. And as you are around it, you'll begin to catch some of it. And you'll begin to experience it. And what I mean when I say worship stirs worship is whatever your on-ramp is, whatever your starting point is, that process is going to begin to stir up worship in the other areas of your life if you keep pursuing it. And so if you hear somebody that might come up here and say, you know, well, you know, I I worship for three hours every morning, you think, well, who has time for that? You know, now, and the truth is, you know, maybe you're scheduled, but that's not the point. The point is that, that if someone uh, is, a, is, is encountering God in a way that they're... Because I got to back up. I, 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 can't, I can't run past this. God is not keeping a checklist. He's not like clocking the time. And so like I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to prescribe to you this is what you need to do. You need to have you know, X amount of time to be qualified as spiritual. No, what I'm saying is let yourself off the hook a little bit, but also let yourself be drawn in. So there's a reality to discipline that, you know, I might get up one morning and one of the ways that I interact with God, especially in the morning, is I actually listen to the Bible. I have an app, some of you are familiar with this, called Lectio 365. They're anywhere from five to ten minutes um, I can put a link on uh, Church Center for anybody who's interested. Um, they're anywhere from five to ten minutes, and and some and and there's a sort of a process they go through and they read script, but but I'm able to just listen, because for me to just first wake up and just start reading that it's not as good of an on ramp for me, so I, I I do this process and and I listen, and that helps me uh, center my day. Helps me to, to get my mind in the right place, to, to focus on the right thing. Well, my point is, allow yourself to sort of be guided by what draws you. Wherever your on-ramp is, just get started there. But as you catch worship, it's going to begin to inform the other areas of your life. And so it, I'm not up here to tell you that the goal to be more spiritual and to be more right with God is that you've just got to put in more time. Now, we do need to spend time with Him. It's like any other relationship. The more you spend time with somebody, the more you're going to get to know them. But don't ever do it out of obligation, out of a, a, a checklist. Allow yourself to enter in to encounter him, to engage with him. And you will find that when you find something that works, now, like I said, there are days where it's like, I don't feel like doing it. I'm going to do it anyway. 
And God meets me in that. Sometimes that's just the enemy trying to push back. Yeah, you, you don't really have time for that today. Well, you know what? I'm going to make time because it's important. I just don't want you to get... The, it's like a lot of things in this world. If you're going down the road, there's ditches on both sides, and we want to try to stay between the lines, right? So, so there's the ditch of legalism, and then I'm just doing it so I can say, I got my worship done and check that off my list and then go the rest of my day and never give God another thought. That, that's, that's one of the ditches. And, and the other ditch is, well, I've got I've to just like push myself that that's all I can do 24-7 in order to get in His good graces, in order to, to really pursue Him and, and grow. And it's just strictly about, you know... Well, if I worship for 15 minutes a day last week, I got to do an hour of this. Don't, don't, don't make it a, don't, in either extreme, don't, don't make it a list. Don't make it a task. All right, I'm, I'm going to get off of that for now. Psalms 27, 4, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, I actually have a, a short video clip that I'm going to use here to wrap up the message in just a moment. But before I do that, let's read Psalm 27, 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His holy temple. Uh, the song that we sang earlier, like, there's no place I'd rather be. When I say that worship is a place that we're going, that place is the presence of God. And eventually, we're going to actually be immersed in it for all of eternity. But even now, it's a place that we're going, is that we want to live in the house of the Lord. We want to dwell in His presence. And that's available 24-7. There's benefit to doing it corporately, but it but His presence is available to you 24 It never has to be farther away than that arm's length that we were talking about. Just before we wrap up, I just want to also point out a resource. Um, if you found uh, that, hey, this is something I'd just like to dig into more. I'd like to learn more about what this can look like or what the values around it are. I printed off a few copies of this booklet, which is based off of John Wimber's teaching called What is Worship? Um, and I have a few copies back there on the table, both in English and Spanish. And so if you are interested, uh, those are free for you to take. Just grab a copy. If we run out, I can make more. Um, but there's some great stuff in here. And uh, yeah, so I just want to mention that. Um, let me kind of set this up. So this is about a four-minute clip that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with. Excuse me. This is John Wimber teaching um, just sort of an excerpt um, about worship. And I think it's so helpful the way that he frames it, talking about who we worship. And then after this clip, I'll come up and uh, make a closing comment, and we'll spend some time praying for each other. All right? So, guys, when you're ready, make sure the volume's up and go ahead and roll that Over clip. Over the years, I, having been a pastor quite a few years, I've heard. Over the years, I, having been a pastor quite a few years, I've heard numerous times, oh, I didn't get anything out of worship. <laughs> and, I, and I gently explain to them, you're not supposed to get anything out of worship. You're supposed to give something out of worship. It's not for you, it's him. <laughs> years and years ago, I was at uh, one of my friend, children's friend's birthday party. She was only six, if I remember right. And we went, and her older sister, who was eight, was angry. Because everything, all the birthday stuff said the other girl's name, and all the birthday stuff was for her. It had pictures of her all over the house and all over the patio area. And there was a big prize and gift for her, and there was a cake for her. And the mother had, at one point, the older sister was stamping her foot and in, just with indignant rage, you know. And her mother had to pull her aside, and I still remember her gently but firmly saying, it's not about you. 
It's about your sister. It's your sister's birthday, not your birthday. I've never forgotten that. Now, I don't mean to do that to you, but I want you to know it's not about you. It's about him. It's about you growing closer to him. It's about you being prepared by the blood of Jesus, through the forgiveness of God, by the drawing of God to, to worship him. So worship isn't for you. It's for him. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's for him. <laughs> now, if you got that, you got the price of admission right there. Because that's what it's all about. Now, I love it. I like what happens. I like the dynamic of it, the vibes and all. I mean, I love it. And uh, it, it's a, a major, major part of my life. But the center of it is, does it please you, Lord? Does it please you? Does our collecting together and worshiping, congregating together and worshiping please you? Is it blessing you, Lord? Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. A good worship service then has both the dynamic of being graded and received in heaven as well as what happens here. We might walk away and say, well, that was a good one, but the Lord's going, <laughs> you know, you're drawing near to me with your mouth, but your hearts are far from me. That was how, what happened in the... Gospels, remember? And so it's very important for us to understand that worship, beginning and end, is for God. And that this is preparation for that that is to come. A few years back, I, I can't remember what it was, but I walked into my grandson's, one of my grandsons. I have 11 of them, grandchildren. And this one was about nine at the time. And he, it was early afternoon, and he had the television on, and he was watching one of these... Um, like highway patrol movies or, or, or screening. I don't even know. I don't watch them, so I don't know exactly what they are. But they, they evidently they are either enacting or taking actual footage of arresting somebody. And uh, one of the uh, the policemen were standing outside, and they had a gun. And this guy gets out of the car, and he goes like that. <clears throat> And Courtney turns out and looks, is he worshiping? <laughs> Get it? Get it? You see, that's what this is. I give. You're right, I'm wrong. You're holy, I'm not. I yield myself to you. I give myself to you. You're the only good I've ever known. The only resource on earth for life. You, oh God, are all of it. It's all about you. All right, we're going somewhere, and we're going to do something. We're going to worship God forever. No coffee breaks. All right? That's what I'm telling you. Uh, interestingly enough, we actually ran out of coffee this morning. So uh, we brewed a little bit more. So if you need a cup after service, there is some more coffee out there now. Why don't you go ahead and stand? I want to actually read something to you. In just a moment. But let's just take a moment. You know, now, I, as I said earlier, you know, we most often associate expressing our worship uh, with music, and that's good. That's a, it's actually a really good vehicle, but it's not the only one. And so, what I want us to do right now is to just sort of posture your heart. And if you want to posture your hands or your body in, in some way, but just posture your heart. Uh, towards God, just like your affection towards Him. And I'm just going to read this sort of over you and on your behalf. This is just a short, simple prayer. But just keep your attention on the Lord. Holy Spirit, help me to rest today 
As I do so, give me wisdom. I welcome your presence and revelation in my life. Converse with my spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight today. Jesus, we just pause as we turn our affection towards you and say you are the one that we gather for. You are the one that we worship. You are the only one who is worthy. And Father, we may feel like we don't have much to give, but actually all you ask for is for us to give of ourselves. And so right now, we give ourselves to you. We open our hearts, we open our minds, and we say, come Holy Spirit. like honey on my lips, your spirit like water to my soul, your word is a lamp unto my feet, Jesus I love you, I love you. Some of you are experiencing God in a way that's new or maybe different. And so I'd encourage you just to press into that. However he's interacting with you, you might be having a, a sensation of warmth or tingling or something along those lines. Uh, for some people, they might experience what feels like waves of electricity uh, I know that sounds strange, but if you're experiencing it, it's helpful to, to have some language. And that's simply God's glory, just beginning to encounter you. And it's hard to describe what can be accomplished in those moments. Worship team, why don't you guys go ahead and come up if you would. And you could just start playing quietly and then we'll we we'll, might sing a chorus here in a moment. I just want to make sure that we give opportunity to to pray for each other and to for you to respond. I mean, part of what we've been talking about in this whole thing is that. You know, when, when God's glory comes or when his presence comes, then there's a response that's, that's required. And I, I don't mean required, again, in, in a legalistic way, but it's like it, it demands a response if we truly think it's real. If, if we recognize it's God, it, he's worth a response. And so I, I, I can't fill in the blanks for each one of you what that response might look like. But if you have a, a sense in your heart or a thought that went across your mind, you know, we all, we, we believe in, in the spaghetti theory here at Vineyard Peoria. Sometimes the best way to find out is to just try, like throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And there's room to fail. So if you have a thought and 
and you step out and try it and you find out maybe that wasn't God, that's okay. You tried. And maybe you learned something. So I just want to give you permission to, to try, to practice hearing and responding. of the ministry team, would you all come up over here to my left and be available to pray. And we're just going to sing a, a, a chorus. And you can go ahead and come up. Uh, at any point in time, these folks are trained to pray. They'll do so in, in confidence and with uh, respect for your dignity. But we'd love to partner with you. And if you're joining us online, uh, if it's something you feel able to share publicly, just put it right in the comments and we'll, we'll pray with you. If you would like to do something more privately, you can send a note to prayer at vineyardpeoria.org and we'll share that with our team and, and respond back. But it, it's real, friends. It, 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 it makes a difference. God is eagerly waiting and anticipating and working on whatever you're dealing with. And yet, we don't have to wait for him to come out with the answer before we can say it's worth it to worship him. So we're going to spend just a couple minutes singing. If you would like to come up and get prayer, uh, go ahead and begin to do that. Um, I'll come up and dismiss us in a few minutes and uh, give some final instructions. All right? share a couple of sort of words or impressions that myself or someone on the team felt the Lord might be highlighting today. And one of those this morning was, uh, and this is not necessarily a physical thing, uh, you know, we all probably deal with varying levels of anxiety or depression, but had a sense today that, uh, and maybe it's not visibly obvious to those around you. But if you feel like you've been dealing with a level that's like debilitating, like just really, really difficult levels of... Now, if you're at a lower level, we're still happy to pray for you. But the impression was that there was at least one or more people that uh, were just dealing with, like I said, sort of an extreme level of depression or anxiety to the point of being somewhat debilitating. I think the Lord wants to begin to work on that. necessarily like wave a magic wand but but even those difficult cases the, the Lord can can work in those areas so we'd love to pray with you and, and uh, help speak life and freedom over you the other one uh, was about uh, strained relationships um, for whatever reason 
season and you just have a really difficult relationship, I don't know. I had some sense that maybe part of it was uh, an inability or an unwillingness to, to forgive. Whether that's on your part or theirs, I, I don't know. But if it's one of those things where you recognize know I need to do this. I know I need to deal with this, but I just don't feel like I can. That's fair. That's, that's okay. But the Lord can give you the ability to be able to, to step out and take care of those things so that that relationship can begin to be healed and, and move towards health. So if you have anything else, we would love to meet with you, pray with you. Uh, if you need help signing up for anything, I'll be in the back. If you're staying for our Vineyard Connect lunch, um, we're going to meet in the kids' room um, at about 11.40. So we need about 20, 25 minutes to make sure we get everything set up. So hang out, chat, talk, get prayer. But, but by no later than 11.40, maybe as early as 11.30, you can start making your way back into the room there. Um, and that will last just about 60 minutes. We'll eat, we'll share. So, and if for some reason you, you didn't sign up, but you thought, yeah, I have some questions, or I, that, that's okay. You're welcome to come. Uh, get to know us a little better, we'll get to know you better. All right? Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for everyone here. Thank you for our friends online. And I just ask that you would bless this week. Um, give us opportunities to bring your light and your kingdom to those around us. Show us ways that you're working and help us become students of worshiping you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, be sure to come back next week. Next week is uh, Kids in the Kingdom. Uh, really excited to talk about that. All right, we love you. You're dismissed.